I'd like to welcome everyone who showed up today. Um, I guess the coffee chat's still going on. It's hard to get things started once everyone starts chatting again. But this is being broadcast and it's going to be recorded, so it's going to be here when people are ready for it. Um, today I'm talking about integrating um, Besu, the Besu EVM and Ethereum transactions into the Hedera public network. Um, but first, my name is Dan O'Farron. I'm a principal software engineer at Swirls Labs. Um, and that's a company that works for, Hed for the Hedera network. It's I'll, in a couple more slides, I'll talk about it. Um, I'm one of the maintainers for the Hyperledger Basu project. And I've been with Hyperledger Basu since it was onboarded into, um, into, the, uh, into the Hyperledger ecosystem. It started out as a project at Consensus called Pantheon. And then we brought it into Hyperledger, and I've been there ever since on the Hyperledger, on the Hyperledger side. Um, I'm also a member of the Technical Steering Committee. I've served two terms. Um, this term, I've also been serving as the vice chair um, underneath Tracy Kurt. She's been doing a great job, so I just have to fill in for the occasional meeting. It's, 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 uh, she's doing a great job in being the lead of the Technical Steering Committee. But first, we should talk a little bit about what is Hedera. Um, Hedera is a permission public ledger. It's a proof of stake public ledger um, where the participants that are producing the, producing the, the ledger, um, you know, they have their stake in it. But it's not a blockchain. I almost want to say, you know, it is blockchain, but it's not a blockchain. But one of the unique things is it uses the, the hash graph consensus algorithm. And what makes it different from most uh, traditional blockchains is in this consensus algorithm, there is no block proposer. All of the different nodes that are in consensus, they contribute their transactions continually through a complex acyclic directed graph process where you take your history and someone else's history. And then you can read through all that data and with enough um, spreading of the, of the various nodes, you can come to a very complete conclusion about when transactions came in which order. So they go through this at high speed, they perfectly order everything, and then we just evaluate the EVM transactions through Hashgraph. And there's no leader, there's no memory pool, there's no, no weird stuff like that going on with sandwich trading. On top of that are built um, a, a number of services on top of this Hashgraph algorithm to provide the ledger type services that people are looking for in, in, a, in a distributed ledger. And the first one is a native token service. And this, we can trade fungible and non-fungible tokens through the API represented natively in the, in the ledger. Um, you don't have to go through a smart contract system. These are actual tokens built into Hedera. Um, the next uh, service is the consensus service. And that's kind of a message queue that takes advantage of the hash graph uh, perfect ordering of, of, uh, of the fair ordering of the transactions as they come in. And basically, you can post your messages, and you can see which order they are presented in. And um, as I mentioned in a previous session, um, we have a plugin called Pluggable HCS in Hyperledger Labs, where you can use that uh, that consensus service to serve as an orderer for uh, the uh, Fabric network. And finally, there is the smart contract service, which is mostly what I'm going to talk about today. It's an EVM compatible smart contract service that we brought up to modern Ethereum mainnet compatibility standards. Now, who runs Hedera? These, these stakers I mentioned, it's 26 members. It's a 26 member governing council. I was wrong before and I said it's 23. It's up to 26. It could conceivably hold up to 29. But there's some pretty uh, big names in there you might recognize. Google, IBM, um, some, some specialized names um, as, as well. We got uh, Deutsche Telekom. And the way that they manage this network, the technical aspects of it, you know, they meet in their meetings, they vote on fees and a lot of other stuff. But as far as the technical improvements, these come through Hedera Improvement Proposals. hips.hedera.com has all those Hedera Improvement Proposals. I've written a number of these to, to cover some of the stuff that I'm talking about today in this talk as far as the uh, HTS integration. And Swirls Lab is the company I work for. They are contracted by Hedera. It's a separate company from Swirls Lab to do the technical implementation of these HIPs in the Hedera network and other technical aspects of creating the software to run the Hedera network. And the network itself is run by Hedera and these 26 governing councils. So, so we write the software and they run it. So as far as um, integrating the EVM into, into Hedera, there's three main aspects I'm going to talk about today. The first is the Besu EVM itself. We took the EVM from Besu, the one that's mainnet compatible, and one of the, one of the growing major alternative clients to Geth in Ethereum mainnet. We took that EVM and we used the exact same code in Hedera. It's kind of a process to get there. The next thing we did is we took the native Hedera token service and through a series of system contracts, which you might be more familiar with calling them pre-compiled contracts, we exposed the tokens through it so you can treat them just like regular old um, Ethereum tokens. And finally, there's another project we wrote called Hashio 
which is a JSON RPC bridge. Hedera uses gRPC for its communications. However, most of the Ethereum world uses JSON RPC to talk to its nodes, and a lot of the dApps depend on some semantics in that. And that is an important last mile that we needed to fill in to, to make things work so you could use things like MetaMask and Hardhat when building your Ethereum applications on Hedera. So first, let's talk about the Beisu EVM. Now, Hedera, when it launched a smart contract service, it, has, it had an EVM-compatible uh, implementation. And at the time, they used the Ethereum J implementation. Um, they were about, you know, consensus's uh, um, Pantheon hadn't quite been released yet, so there wasn't much public code. So the Ethereum J, it was good enough. It was compatible up until about the Constantinople hard fork, um, but there were another, other issues that needed to be improved to get it working. So the decision was made to bring in the Beisu EVM, and that's when I came on board to Hedera. So to bring in the Beisu EVM, first we needed to do some groundwork inside Beisu itself. And I call this separating the monolith. There's about four major tasks that we needed to do, or three major tasks. But the reason that these hadn't been split out is because Beisu was a Swiss Army knife binary. It did everything at once. And there was only one real use case for it, and that was to run either private networks or public networks. Um, using the different components outside the context of this Swiss Army knife had not been contemplated before. So we had to turn it into a stack of Legos. And um, when you're building a modular system, you need to have a real use case to ensure that the module boundaries make sense and are usable. So this is kind of the first time when we had something that had an external use case from the Swiss Army knife of Hyperledger Beisu. And for context, um, I am a maintainer of Beisu, and I've been with Hyperledger Beisu since uh, it was brought into, into Hedera, uh, it brought into Hyperledger. Um, I was part of the, one of the original maintainers brought in with the, with the project. Um, so you know, that's why I know a lot about why we built these things the way they did. So we took some of this tight coupling out. There's also some dependency on other code where when you have the assumption that you're all together and you have a type, you can just put it everywhere and put all the things that you need into that type that are needed in the three different components. So we had to take like the gas type, the, the way, which is the, the ether type, and um, some, some native hash types, and move them into a separate package, and remove some of these special features that only the consensus uh, bits needed. And, and we split those out and stuff like the block headers. And tracing depended upon some other components that were deep nested in. So for the standard tracing, we went ahead and re-implemented that. For the standard tracing, that was easy. For the full parity tracing from the parity Ethereum style, that's going to take a bit more work. So that's still sitting in there. Um, we didn't move everything over. Some of the testing code still depends on some of the setup from the monolith to set up things because we got to test things like do the, do the tree get calculated correctly with the Ethereum reference tests. Those were a lot harder to split out. So those went ahead and stayed in the monolith. So the EVM light module is still bit, built in a monolith, but the library pieces are taken out separate. The next thing we needed to do is we needed to address some performance concerns. Um, Ethereum only operated at 1.1 mega gas per second. Yeah, there's 15 or 30 million gas in each block, but each block only comes every 13 and a half seconds. Um, Hedera wanted to do something more on the order of 15 million per second. And if you figure it out, if that's, uh, well, that's about 400, over 400 ERC20 transactions per second that they wanted to do to get it like 400 TPS just on the smart contracts alone. Now for comparison, if you're using the Hedera token service natively, they can do 10,000 TPS, but if they're not doing it through an EVM, you're just doing your token transfers directly in, the, in Hedera. And if that's all you need, it's going to be cheaper to use the HAPI APIs. HAPI is the word I use for the Hedera API, HAPI. So it's quicker and cheaper to do it that way. But if you want to do fancy things, um, such as support DEXs, you would need to use um, the EVM to do that. So there was a lot of, you know, there's you know, four bullet points of things that I had to do, mostly worrying around bit twiddling and moving bits around that we were doing multiple times and calculating things um, into, uh, to different levels. So as a result of this, the quote unquote floor performance of the worst performing operation right now is about 60, milligas, uh, 60 megagas per second. Um, so if all you do is you do SHA-3 hashes all day long, um, you'll get about 60 megagas per second um, if you run it in our, in our tests. Um, nobody does that really. Um, a lot of the other operations perform much better. So that gives us the security guarantees we need to put 15 uh, million gas per second as the performance floor, as the performance ceiling inside of the Hedera node. So we've got a lot of safety margin coming in there. Whereas before we didn't have that safety margin. We also had to update some support to bring it up to date with current EVM standards. 
There was uh, three more opcodes we needed to implement. Um, we gave a chain ID to Hedera. 0x127 is the hexadecimal code for lowercase h with a bar through it. Um, the currency is called hbar. It's some joke about Planck's constant reduced that I don't understand because I was never a physics major. Um, but that's why they picked the h bar. Um, and so we go uh, 0x128 and 0x129 for our test net and preview net. And if you build a local version of it and test it locally, you'll have 12a as your, as your chain ID. We also had to implement self-balance. We needed to do some fee schedule changes to S-Store that were changed since Constantinople. And we needed to support an opcode that was designed for EIP 1554. So we don't support, as the next bullet point, we don't support the EIP 15, no, it's 1559. But we don't support the EIP 1559 fee market. We have our own fee system set up um, that is indexed to the fiat value that we moved the HBAR with. So I needed to put in some support in there um, to you know, return zero for the base fee and do some other uh, exposed, uh, exposing of the exchange rate to make things work properly in the fees. Now looking forward, we're gonna be supporting all changes that are coming in in Shanghai. There's actually one small minor change that's coming in in Paris that we'll support a bit later. They're changing the diff difficulty operation to a Randau operation. And we're gonna support that with something slightly different, but still in the same spirit of taking a running hash from the production of the Hedera network, whereas the Randau is taking something from the production of the consensus layer. So we will replace, be replacing that with a, with a similar operation. Because a lot of people, when they use that difficulty operation, what they're looking for is a, basically some sort of an arbitrary random number in the lower bits. So we'll, we'll deliver that as a seed that they can run their uh, numbers against. Um, the next thing we need to do is we need to worry about accounts. And this is kind of the big thing. Um, we're still going through some of the details in Hedera. Hedera's accounts don't work like Ethereum accounts. We start at 0, 0, 1,000 when we start issuing our accounts on mainnet. Um, we've got over a million accounts right now, so you'd have 0, 0, 1 million and some digits behind it. But these are assigned um, increasing in order from, from linearly. So you create a new account or a new contract, you take the next lot. This is completely opposite from the way Ethereum does it. When you deploy a contract, it takes some bits of information like this is the nonce of the account, this is the account number, put a little magic salt in there, hash it together, and out comes this, this uh, 20 byte, you take the 20 bytes of the SHA3 hash of all of that. So you get something big and convoluted like the 0x address. One advantage there is that you're never gonna have a collision from these, you don't, your contract number doesn't depend on previous deployments. But the downside is it's hard to manage it in an enterprise-friendly fashion. So the initial approach that we did for it was just to map your Hedera account address to what I call the long zero notation. We would take that number, we would smash it down into the hex equivalents. Um, we would need 24 bytes to do all three of the bytes in Java long. So one of these two 0.0s, we're going to have to throw some bytes out. And we think it's going to be the middle one because that's the future plans for it. It's going to have a smaller range. Um, but from that, you get a long address that looks almost like a pre-compiled contract, but it's not really a pre-compiled contract. It does resolve to, when you run it backwards, that's going to be 987654 um, in decimal when you run it. Now, we decided to go on to a different approach where we would allow accounts to take on aliases. And there's a couple of reasons why we would want to do that. One of them is uh, for accounts, uh, this, the reason why aliases were invented, or for exchanges that wanted to fund accounts where they don't know the number, so you set an alias to be the public key. So we used this public key, and we went ahead and calculated the Ethereum address that would go with it for accounts. So if you have an ECDSA key associated with your Hedera account, and you set it as the alias, we can give that big long name that you would see typically in MetaMask for your account and still access it through MetaMask. Um, now only one of these addresses is used um, in the EVM, either the long zero or the EVM address. So if you set an EVM address, you can't access your account via the long zero notation. It's kind of a security flaw to allow an account to be ac accessed by different names. It presents a number of challenges and problems if you allow someone to talk about things in two different ways. So that's the current state of how we're managing accounts. Um, the next thing that we needed to do is we needed to change the way some of the operations to work within the constraints that Hedera required of it. Um, eight different uh, accounts when you access a non-existent account will throw it, will raise a, an exception um, within the EVM. If you're trying to get the balance or the code hash or call an account or contract that does not exist that's above the current number that doesn't have an alias mapping, you'll get uh, an invalid solidity address uh, exception raised within the VM. 
just as if you try to, uh, to access other things. Um, we're looking at changing that, but that's not a guarantee on that right now. So we're looking at rolling that back so we treat it like Ethereum does, where non-existent accounts have a zero balance, they have an empty string for their code, an empty byte string, and if you call one of these objects, you'll just get your data back. Um, if you try and send data, if you try and send value to it, I expect we'll still revert because that's, we, have a, we have some requirements that for creating new accounts that can't be handled effectively um, via just sending HBAR to it like you'd hand in Ethereum. We also need a special integrations for the create and the create too. Like I said, accounts are created uh, sequentially from 0.0 to 1,000. So when you create an account, we need to give that, a, that uh, when you create a contract, we need to return the new contract number. We needed to do something different entirely with create2 because the point of create2 is you get a deterministic contract back based on some input data. Um, this is used heavily by DEXs like Uniswap and SushiSwap, where they would take the two addresses of the coins that you're swapping into their, into their salt and they'd smash it together. So you'd always get the same address. So for create2, we extended the alias concept to smart contracts. When you create2 a smart contract, we're going to put an alias on there of the new address, and that will be used. And the final piece of integration we needed to work on was fees and gas. Hedera has a very rich and complex fee schedule, and they make sure to charge you exactly for what you're using and nothing more. So if you're using long-term storage, stuff you persist at disk, short-term storage, stuff you would keep in memory for the next three minutes um, for other nodes to access. If you're putting stuff in the block record, we charge. We charge for compute. Um, we charge for a number of other things. Um, and we index, index that very lowly. I mean, we also charge for the number of... of um, of signatures we make, you ask to be verified. So if you do a 507 signature on a transaction, we're going to charge you to verify all five of those signatures. Um, and those provide for some really low fees. That's one of the ways they get to low fees is they only charge for what you use. Um, but that had some interesting interactions with, with Ethereum. But what we were able to figure out is for the most part, the Ethereum gas that is charged for these operations already covers the fee um, if, if we do a conversion for the gas price um, to, to HBAR it almost always comes up greater than the fee that's going to be charged. And in the cases where Hedera would charge more, under the covers we charge more. Um, and there's only a few cases, like if you have an account with an expiry that's set to, uh, you know, the 23rd century. That's, that's going to be really expensive. And so that's where the price would come through. But if you're using the default setup where your accounts need to be auto-renewed every three months, it'll look just like the exact same gas schedule that you're going to see in Ethereum. Um, now, one thing that is changing with this issue I said about charging storage for the 23rd century, we're separating the charge for long-term rent um, from the writing of the value on the first time. Um, and that's because we're introducing the notion of state rent into the, the Hedera network, but we're going to charge separately out of the EVM for it. Um, this is something probably going to ship in 2023. Um, some of the bits are leaking into the code now, but the decision hasn't yet been made to flip, flip the switch on it. But that's something that's coming in the future. And that it's going to have a positive effect on the EVM integrations because the gas calculations are going to be a lot more stable and reflect a lot more of what's really going on within it. So the next point of integration is we want to integrate the EVM with Hedera token services. We want people who are using an EVM type smart contract to have the same first class interactions with a Hedera token service token, HTS token, as you might have if you were to deploy your own ERC-20 or ERC-721 contract within the EVM. Um, one of the advantages why I want to encourage people to use the HTS system is it's much more cost efficient and memory efficient and faster. If you give someone a token and they want to trade it, um, they can do it for much cheaper than within the, within the EVM. So the Hedera token services, like I said, it's a, it's a ledger native token that has no interaction with EVM. It exists as a, as a Hedera. Uh, is a Hedera concept. You can do 10,000 transactions per second on these if you're using the Happy. And there's low fees. It's like one one hundredth of a cent to transfer tokens from one person to the next. Um, and we support NFTs, fungible tokens. And again, we access this via the gRPC service. Um, we'll get to this in the, in the next segment of why this is a problem. But if you want to use the native tokens and get the high speed and cheap fees, you have to use the gRPC. There's SDKs that'll help you out with it. It's really easy to code. Um, but you can't do it with hard hat. So that's the downside, is it would require developers to move to a new SDK, which can be a problem. Um, so as far as the EVM side of encouraging to use that, we decided to expose the, the HTS 
services to uh, via what I'm calling a system contract. Ordinarily, you'd call stuff like this a pre-compiled contract, but I want to separate the notion of a pre-compiled contract from a system contract. A pre-compiled contract is something that you could express entirely within Solidity. For example, a lot of crypto primitives you can actually do in Solidity. The reason you wouldn't do it in Solidity is because it's really expensive. It would cost like 2 million gas to verify a signature. That's just way too much gas. So they tell the clients to implement it natively and charge something closer to 20,000 gas to verify a native signature. So that's stuff that does that I would properly call a pre-compiled contract. But what's going on with these uh, system contracts is it's actually breaking a layer. It's leaving the EVM and interacting with the container that's hosting it and, and doing services like you would break out of a container in, in uh, Docker. You would go in and you would access the system and bring it back in. So that's where the system contract concept comes from. So these services that you can do, you can transfer, you can mint and burn your tokens, you can create new tokens, you can change the keys on your tokens. Um, and you can do this via a Solidity interface. All of these services, you can do all of these calls via a gRPC happy service, but now we'll let you do it through a uh, EVM system contract. Um, there are some really useful use cases for these. There's a company called Galaxy um, that is letting people create, um, tokenize themselves and their followers. So if you have a really popular YouTube channel, you could create a token of, of high fives. You could give people, hey, 100 high fives for, for liking my stream. So you could create that token, and in the smart contract, you can automate the creation of it and handle it and set it up in an automated fashion. Um, and you could mint more high fives if you need it. You could burn the high fives if you have too many. You could create NFTs. Um, you could transfer your NFTs within these smart contracts. So Galaxy is one example of, of where you might want to do some of those things in an automated fashion. Now the smart contract address is 0x167. That is T with a bar through it. I, I like the Unicode jokes when I pick out my random numbers. Um, we also in the SDK have um, easy access to, to, to call these smart contracts as though you're calling another contract. There's a, there's a quirk in Solidity where when you call any contract first, it's gonna, they're going to make sure code's there before it issues the call. So one of the classes we have in there deals with that quirk. Um, you can write it in Solidity to do the call. It's really ugly looking. It's not as easy as a function. So we write a function for you that will do that ugly unwrapped call um, for you, and it will uh, look just like a Solidity call, and it's, it's an internal function. So it'll inline, and it'll be just the same as if you did it yourself. So those are in the SDK and the smart contracts repository to use these, these tokens as, as though they were just another smart contract. Another thing we did for the, for the tokens themselves, so like I said, there's an account and your smart contract has an account. All of these accounts come from the same number space. So if you post a token, it's going to come from that same sequence of numbers, which again maps to a Hedera address that I call the long zero address. So what we integrated was a series of redirect contracts into the, um, into the HTS system contract that allows you to treat these, these uh, tokens and their EVM addresses as though they were ERC-20 or ERC-721 tokens. And this allows you, when you hook your, hook your uh, MetaMask up via Hashio, you can see your token balance as though it's, a, so it's an ERC-20 token. You can trade your ERC-721s just like it's a regular old NFT. Um, and uh, let me go through the notes here, make sure I get everything covered. And it, it was published by HIP218. I talked about the HIP process. Um, this is how he specified how he would be interacting with it. And uh, the contract redirects to 167. So your contract at OOFFFF, if that's your uh, Ethereum address for your token, it would then redirect it, put the token address in there, and call a different method in the system contract. Um, now, one interesting thing about this to prove that it works, not only you know, I've seen my NFTs in, in MetaMask and my tokens in NFTs, but one of our partners in the demo the other day showed us how they got the 0x order book working with our NFTs. You could put your NFT in an order book, and it could be uh, filled by a different, different DEX that's on the system, and it just works like magic because we implemented all these standard APIs that are standard in Ethereum, and they just work with, with you know, they didn't think it was a big deal that they got 0x working, but I'd known the internals and I know the struggles that we had with it. For them to get that working without having to come back and asking for tech support was just like, wow, it's like working like we expected. This is awesome. Um, so a little, little bit of developer anxiety that I'm sharing there. Every developer feels like that when they ship a new feature. Um, so quickly, there's a couple of other system contracts that we exposed to expose system information in there. 
The first one is the exchange rate. Um, like I mentioned before, I don't think I mentioned it here actually, um, Hedera's fees are fixed to fiat. So we, we every so often we go out and we figure out what the, what the consensus exchange rate is of H bar to dollars. We feed that into a, an exchange rate calculator. So we calculate your fees that we're gonna charge and we convert that to H bars. So it's still gonna cost you one hundredth of a cent in H bars to do your transfer. So if you want to, inside of your smart contract, figure out what that exchange rate is, um, rather than doing math with the gas cost and making assumptions about the schedule, you can just ask it, you know, what is the current exchange rate in, in H bars? And what's the current exchange rate of H bars to, to, to tiny cents is what we call it. And we'll return that information. And there's another smart contract, the PRNGC. This is the one I'm going to be integrating to give the same sort of functionality as, as Randau. Um, the, some of the technical details, we keep a running hash of our transactions. And the decision was to go to a transaction three transactions ago and take that running hash from that transaction and use that as the, as the, random, as the pseudo random seed. So you can get that information, put it in your smart contract. You can, with, with more safety, generate random numbers. I mean, ran, generating random numbers in a smart contract is always a danger field proposition. But this provides you a source of randomness that's a little less predictable and less controllable and more repeatable. Um, and just randomness in smart contracts deserves its own 20 minute session to describe exactly how to do it right and how to do it wrong. Um, both of these contracts, like the other smart contracts we've exposed, the system contracts, use uh, a Solidity ABI. So you call these as though you're calling another Solidity contract. And we have contract uh, calls to support this. So any questions before I go on to the next section? This is like a big brain dump and you're just trying to absorb it. Cool. So the last thing I want to talk about um, is the Hedera JSON RPC bridge and Hashio project. Hashio is the branded version that we're hosting, but it's actually a JSON RPC bridge. And what we need this for is to solve the last mile problem, what I call the last mile problem of getting people to use Hedera from Ethereum. Um, the developer tools that people use depend on the Ethereum way of accessing the network. They depend on a JSON RPC interface that responds to certain JSON RPC calls. And some very deep assumptions about the Ethereum network are built into that. Um, for example, the way that the transactions, um, it's, it's just one transaction type, it's RLP encoded, you gotta sign it with an ECDSA key, and your ESA, ECDSA key has to match to the account that you're working through. These are some pretty deep assumptions that run counter to some of the things we've done inside of Hedera. For example, we have a gRPC account. Um, all of our accounts are not tied to a particular key. You can rotate your keys. You can say that your account is a three of seven multi-sig. You can say that your account is a multi-sig that requires signatures from three groups. You need someone from admin, you need someone from finance, you need someone from the executive. And you can do these really complex, awesome trees that ESG people love to see go on with it that Ethereum can't do and do it natively. But when it comes to calling something via MetaMask, MetaMask doesn't know or care that you have a rich and thorough key hierarchy. All they know is that they got a private key that's gonna sign this transaction to do this call, and they're gonna send it to you, and hopefully you're ready to receive it. Um, so, so those are some of the things that we needed to, to solve. And we need to solve these problems because a lot of these dApps out there, a lot of these white label apps that we're trying to bring in, they have to work in the Ethereum way because that is becoming um, the, the, the IBM PC compatible of the smart contract world. It's not the only game out there, but it's the biggest game, and it's the game that gets you the most traction amongst all the chains. So building the JSON RPC support allows us to be one of the players in there and give them access to Hedera um, via the tools that they have. So the first thing that we did to support this, one of the deepest problems is sending transactions. So we created a new Hedera transaction type called Ethereum transaction. It's a really simple transaction. It has the signed bytes of an Ethereum transaction. And then it's a relayer that wraps the transaction. And they're paying for bringing this transaction to consensus in the hash graph, and they're paying for nothing else. Everything else is paid for by whoever signed that Ethereum transaction. And the key that signed the Ethereum transaction is brought into the key set. So if you have that ECDSA key in your account key that it maps to, and you've signed that transaction, then you don't need any other signatures in the relayer. So this is designed for simple cases where if you have an account and you just want to interact with Ethereum and EVM type stuff, you would create one account that has one key, that one key is ECDSA, and you set that as the alias, and that's how you would interact with it. 
Um, and so the, uh, the, gas key, the gas cost, there's some things in the transaction we can pay attention to and some things we can't. If you set a gas cost on there that is lower than the fixed gas cost of Hedera, we're going to reject it. If you're using 1559 and your max fee allows for it to be covered, we'll charge you the actual fee. But if you're using a type 1 transaction and you set a ridiculously high gas price, the, the, the agreement you're making with a type 1 transaction is we're going to charge you as much as you ask for. So if, you, if, you, if you, we halfway support 1559 and that you'll set a maximum fee and we'll only charge you the literal fees we have to charge you per the standard fee schedule. Um, and one other feature that we have in here is that the signer has the opportunity also to pay for the fees for you if they choose. They can list the maximum amount of HBAR that they're willing to pay. I don't think I put that on this slide. Oh yeah, it's the second bullet on the top. So the relayer can offer to pay for a certain amount of the, of the transactions. They can pay for part of the transaction or all of the transaction. So this actually opens up the opportunities for, uh, for meta transactions. For example, for game use cases, they want to use ADAPT, they need a zero gas network. You just need to set up a relayer that's going to pay for all the fees that come in for all of your game transactions you want to work on Hedera. And so we support this. The, the public testnet, of course, won't do it. You'll need a, the public Hashio instance. You'll need to set up your own instance with your own relayer. And if you do things right, you could relay it to a node that you have an agreement with that you'll get the fees back from. So if, if Google wanted to host a game, they could just point it at their game, and the, the gas fees would, to some extent, become circular. The JSON RPC bridge, we also needed to implement all of the other queries that are in JSON RPC. And it's a mix of, um, so let's see, we do the happy, the raw transactions, I don't think I discussed that too much in this. So I'm going to go off slide and just talk about this a little bit. But we had to implement all of the different um, JSON RPC transactions. And sometimes we need to go to the Hedera node and do a paid transaction. And sometimes we go to our mirror node. Um, I didn't get a slide in here to show the typical network architecture. But getting items from the hit consensus nodes, we always charge because you're getting in the way of consensus. We need to limit it and incentivize people to use other sources. We have another system called the mirror node that takes, the, uh, takes the, the transaction stream and makes it available for free that you can read from and stand up your own instance to get the data from. So some of these calls we can go to the mirror node and where we can go to a mirror node we do to get them for free. Some of them we go to the consensus nodes and the mirror node is in the middle of upgrading to support more and more of these rich calls because we still have some, uh, we can't do debug, get storage at quite yet because we don't have that available on the mirror node but they're improving these uh, and we'll be able to support all of these eventually. And the reason we need some of these, these strange calls like uh, get storage at and um, get contract data is because some of the development tools like MetaMask, Truffle, and Hardhat uh, like to get at this information when they're doing debugging work. So we'll expose this. Um, we're exposing some of these through the developer tools. The developer tools won't perfectly work yet. It's still a beta. The only thing we targeted for this stage is to get web wallets like MetaMask and uh, Tally working correctly. And so those, those are the ones that we focus on right now. But our, our, our roadmap item is to get this working with the developer tool seamlessly and transparently. So all you have to do is just point your developer tool at a different RPC endpoint, and then suddenly you're on Hedera. Now, when I say that, that you know, we just want to make it transparent and go to Hedera, you need to ask, well, why would you go to Hedera? So there's some key differentiators that we like to remind developers when they're developing transactions and they're putting them on the various EVM compatible chains. Um, one of the biggest things that we like to point out about Hedera is that there is no transaction pool. There's no mempool. Once you post a transaction on Hedera, it's fixed in that position. Nobody can censor it. It's going to go through consensus. Um, so there's no sandwich trading. There's no minor extractable value. There's no games with ordering things out of the pool or trying to keep your tornado cash, tran tornado cash transactions out of it. We're going to take them all as they come in. Um, the next thing, and this is really the secret to how we get our performance speed, is that ordering and execution of these transactions are separate steps. We order the transactions and then we execute them. We don't play a game. We say, well, is this transaction going to succeed? If it's not, well, then we can't put it in. Every transaction that comes to consensus gets executed after the order is set. So there's no consideration for the side effects. And things go fast enough, we really don't have time to do that. And finally, there's continuous transaction execution. We don't wait. 10 seconds and give you a report of you know, 5,000 transactions that went through. Every second, every time we can come to consensus 
and figure out that a transaction has reached final order, we will execute it continually on each of the nodes. We don't have to wait for an agreement to pick out who's the next leader and wait for them to propose or not propose a block. Um, this is asynchronous BFT. Everything just comes out all the same. So as a quick uh, a summary, the three major things that we needed to do to bring the BASU EVM and Ethereum transactions to Hedera was first we needed to upgrade to the BASU EVM to get mainnet compatibility and to get the performance we needed. The next thing we did is we exposed our Hedera token services via system contracts so that EVM users can with full fidelity use the same Hedera token services that our non-EVM users can get access to. It's faster and cheaper to do it outside the EVM, but it's possible in the EVM. And for a lot of use cases like DEXs, they're more than willing to pay the premium and take the speed hip to get what they need. And finally, we solved the last mile problem by Project Hashio, where we provide a JSON RPC bridge that talks to Hedera in the RPC mechanisms Hedera talks about, while at the same time making it open for, um, for uh, developer tools to work and interact that were designed to work with the Ethereum ecosystem and get those working with Hedera and get your, develop and get your web wallets and everything working with that. So here's some links. Um, like almost every company here, Hedera is hiring. Swirlslabs.com slash careers if you want to see the open list. Um, but if you want to get a hold of me, um, I am at Shemnon on Twitter and GitHub. On Discord, I guess I'm Shemnon number 2321. You need those numbers because Discord's Discord. Or if you like email, if you're part of my generation and still use email, you can use dano.farron at swirlslabs.com. Um, there's also links to Hedera, Swirls Labs, and the various projects that I listed here. Any questions? There's got to be one question. Did I explain everything perfectly? There's always a chance. Brett, did I miss anything? Do I know anyone starting to use these capabilities? Do I know anyone I can talk about? Um, I think I can mention Open Zeppelin because they're part of the Australia ANZ Bank uh, stablecoin currency. Uh, one of the features that they needed to support, because um, of their governance, they needed this project that Open Zeppelin had called Defender. And it only really worked well via JSON RPC. And we talked to them. It's like, hey, could you convert to Happy? And they said, um, how much money and are you going to give us the engineers? Um, which is a typical problem in, in the smart contract space right now because we're engineering constrained on almost everything. But when we bring them a JSON RPC bridge, they can access Hedera and get the information they need through JSON RPC, their tool just magically works because it's speaking in the language it's expecting and it gives them all the feedback and telemetry that they needed. So, so that's someone that I know that is using it today. Even though we're not done building it, it's providing all the features that they need. Cool. Um, well, if anyone has any questions, you can grab me in the hall. I'll be here today and tomorrow. I'm flying back on Wednesday, and I'm probably going to be in the air when this Ethereum merge event happens, unless it keeps getting pushed into Thursday. So, all right. Thanks. <laughs>